Islamic Republic's systematic essay of Iranian protesters exposed. So because YouTube hates sensitive words, I have to use a little bit of coded language and it's going to be very difficult for this news story. But when I say SA or SAID, I'm talking about RAPE. Okay. Um, so why bear SA? with me. Huh? Okay. Why is that the code? I'm it stands for sexual oh okay. youtube also okay. doesn't like that word either okay just say just just spell it just say r-a-p-e i think okay, that's okay. a bit so you don't have to explain it every time just say r-a-p-e every time yes okay um islamic republic's systematic r-a-p-e of iranian protesters exposed a new CNN special report reveals the shocking truth behind the Islamic Republic's brutal and repressive treatment of Iranian protesters amidst the growing uprising against the regime. The report particularly focused on the story of 20-year-old female protester Amrita Abbasi, corroborating for the first time the gruesome and horrific details of her treatment by regime authorities. And I don't normally give a trigger warning, but just heads up, this is legitimately really horrific. When the protests began, Amrita criticized the Iranian government through social media. But unlike other protesters inside Iran, she didn't do it anonymously, posting her criticism publicly on Instagram. Amrita went missing after her arrest in the city of Karaj on October 10th, appearing again on October 18th when authorities brought her to the Imam Ali hospital. Authorities released a statement asserting that Amrita was sent to the hospital due to digestive problems, but leaks gathered from medical staff at the hospital and verified by CNN say that Amrita was bleeding severely from her rectum as a result of brutal RAPE. Staff members say that her head had been shaved and she had appeared in such a bad condition that initially they thought she had cancer. Quote, when she first came in, the officers said that she was hemorrhaging from her rectum due to repeated RAPE. The plainclothes men insisted that the, doc that the doctor write it as RAPE prior to arrest. A staff member wrote in a message to CNN, quote, to make it short, they screwed up. They screwed up and they don't know how to put it back together again. Before Amrita's family could see her, officers whisked her out of the back entrance of the hospital, and they now claim that she is in Farzi's prison. The report also interviewed numerous other protesters who detailed a system of using RAPE as a weapon to, of torture against detainees, including children, as well as using it as a tool to create forced confessions. Yeah, and even if the even if they don't do the R A P E them, sometimes they do it themselves. Sometimes they just put you next to prisoners that are famous for doing that to you, um, you know, as an intimidation tactic. So there are certain uh, female prisons in Iran where they mix political prisoners with other prisoners who are actual dangerous criminals, and a lot of these women. Um, Sex, sexually harass an RAPE other women, including children, including like female prisoners as young as 16 or, you know, 14, uh, 14. yeah. And they get, um, and, and the, the understanding is that this is where you're going to be and you're going to be RAPE by these other prisoners, uh, unless you give us forced confessions and we might actually if transfer you to another safer place. Uh, away from these dangerous criminals if you give us like if you tell us things that we want to and then, then they record you telling you <clears throat> things that are so obviously forced confessions and i don't even know <clears throat> why the government goes through i mean actually i do know the government goes through so much trouble coming up with forced confessions given that people know that these are forced confessions but the the reason why they get these forced confessions is for the people who still support the regime they require these narratives as a way to justify what they're doing to these prisoners yeah forever storm is saying this is sick the regime is sick yeah it's um and they you know they do some they do have um among themselves religious justifications for it as well because like you could 
use certain Quranic verses as a way to justify um, treating prisoners um, in such a way. So they do have their own weird justifications for it. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, this was extremely important to cover because I actually mentioned the story of Amrita on the show a few weeks ago. But at the time I said, you know, this is what's being reported on social media, but we can't like 100% confirm this right now. But now we can. Now, now we can. can actually say that this has been corroborated by multiple sources, by multiple leaks from inside the hospital itself. The CNN has gone through how the authorities' narrative doesn't um, stand, so to speak. Like the, it, it doesn't, it, it it contradicts itself. And then also, they not only did they corroborate the story of Amrita but they interviewed numerous other Iranian women who escaped into Iraqi Kurdistan and their experiences of being sexually assaulted by authorities when they were detained. And oftentimes it's used as a, basically like a threat for, um, what was I going to say? Like, Oh, okay. So here's an example. They gave one story of these two sisters that were detained together. And basically they take one sister and they say, unless you want to watch your sister get RAPE'd, you're going to do what we yeah. say right now. So they use it as a direct threat. But what Armin was saying about how this happens to female prisoners, let's be completely clear. This happens to male prisoners as well. Yes. This happens to male children as well. Yeah. And um i wanted to read i mean one. um this happens often before they sent to prison it was uh, amrita uh, this happened to her before she was delivered to prison right like her case wasn't inside the prison her case was at the point of after the arrest before delivery to prison is that correct that part isn't entirely clear mm. she was arrested and then just disappeared and then the yes. next time anyone saw her was when she was at the hospital. And authorities right. so, said, say that this happened prior to arrest. Yes, yes, yes. So my guess is that this is at the time where you are not even had. So f as bad as these prisons are, okay, a lot, um, what I hear from activists on the ground in Iran is that you would want to be delivered to prison as fast as possible because the most the unsafest period of time is the time that you're held for what they call bazri for the integra if the inter integration what is it inter interrogation inter i don't know why i can't say that word um but th at that time right um which is which is the time that they will commit the most violence um p potentially because they want that's when they that's when you are at the hands of the besiege or the sepah hands, and they don't want to deliver you to the prison because they would not be able to uh, interrogate you. Um, oh, I said interrogation. Oh, they wouldn't be able to interrogate you at that uh, after they deliver to you to the prison in the way they want to, because now you're in the system, right? They want to make sure that they have you, they have you in their control, um, and they are intimidating you. And so you become safer relatively like safe, like the prison situation is still very unsafe, but you become a lot safer once you are delivered to the prison. So if I had to guess, I don't have all the information, uh, but if I had to guess is that this happened to her, not in prison uh, by the, you know, by the staff, but by the forces inside the prison, by, by the officers at after her arrest, right? Well, because um, that's also, I've also in the period yeah. of time in which they can basically forcibly disappear you. And that's what the yes. CNN report talks a lot about, is <laughs> most of the reports that they received regarding this were coming out of the rest, predominantly Kurdish regions of Iran. And what they'll do is they'll get you into one detention center, and then they'll start transferring you in between this web of prisons all along the west b western border yes. to help make it impossible for anyone to find you track you you know be in touch with your case help represent you or advocate for you you're just lost in the system at that point 
Yes, yes. I've also heard reports from women in Iran who are part of the protest or at the time of arrest or during the protest where the um where the office with the armed forces or the regime forces they come and sodomize you or with the with the batons and when these women like screaming you know and respond um, negatively when they complain they they act like they're shocked they're like aren't you guys doing the revolution for this like isn't this what you guys want like uh, you guys are all about sexual liberation and all that stuff and this is what i'm giving you so why are you guys even complaining about this like this your entire movement is about being naked and being sexually free so this is what I, you got you are like they call them you you whores you sluts this is what you want i'm just giving you what you're asking for i'm giving i'm just giving you what you're chanting for so that's the response huh? Susanna just can't take it oh my god yeah yeah so, i mean oh god yeah it's really it's really 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 horrific there's one part from the um, CNN report that I want to read. Um, uh, in one case, CNN inter received the audio testimony of a 17 year old boy who said that his friends, he and his friends were RAPE'd and electrocuted in detention when they were arrested in the protest. Testimonies heard by CNN suggest that the, that the sexual assault of the underage boy was not an isolated incident. They brought four men over who had been beaten, screaming intensely in another cell. And one of the men who was tortured was sent to the waiting room where I was, the boy told CNN. I asked him what all that screaming was about. They said that they are RAPing the men. The security guard overheard the conversation about the assault, the boy said, and after which he proceeded to torture him. The boy said that then he that he was then also RAPE. So just yeah, by just because I, it, yeah, yeah, just because just for talking about it. They're like, oh, you're spreading the news? Well, let's give you some of that, you know, treatment as well. This is super um, notorious in the men's prisons where they will take, yeah, like political protesters and put them with the hardened criminals. And then the hardened criminals will be incentivized to do this to the protesters. Because they're straight up thugs. And we know that the, the regime uses thugs to do their dirty work because it was exposed in the Abon Tribunal about how they used criminals to be agent provocateurs in the 2009 demonstrations. I mean, 2019 demonstrations. We know this. We know that they hire legit violent criminals to do their dirty work. Um, Part of the reason why they do this is because a lot of the protest movement have seemed to be uh, fearless when it comes to death, right? So given that a youth, it, it doesn't intimidating people with the fear of death, it doesn't seem to be working on making people go home. They're trying to use something that people, especially this woman led revolution and even, and also to be fair, men also fear more than death. Right. So a lot of these people uh, fear this kind of treatment a lot more than they would fear being killed. And that's why the regime is trying to use max when they want to use maximum pressure as a way. And they they like the regime doesn't try to do try to hide this. Right. When you see this happening to these prisoners, um, you would think like, oh, my God, uh, good thing this like good thing it was exposed or leaked well the thing is that the leaking was done by the regime itself like the regime wants other people to know that this is what could happen to you because they are de they're desperate in using methods that will make the protesters actually fear the government right so then you know but the thing is that protesters are still coming out even after all this information because it actually angers them more and they want to they're they want to retaliate right harris is saying i was just doing research on armita abasi this is shocking armin do you think armita's armita's case is going to fuel the protest even more oh yeah for sure but it's not just armita like we have we could spend hours just going through case after case after case for you that will make your blood boil right like i have 
a huge folder of things that I could show you that is making people go angry, that is fueling every, fueling the protesters every day. Like Kian's story was like, 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 I don't know, like this, right? This lady, mm -hmm. oh, this lady, she, she lost her eye. Do you know her name? I forgot her name because there's just so many names. I now, can't, right? give me a few seconds to Google it. I can find it, but she's only like 20 years old. Yeah, she lost her eye because she was trying to protect her mother. She was trying to block the shotgun. Uh, her, she was standing in front of the shotgun. Um, I don't know what they're called. Uh, um, it's not bullets because they are like metal. Um, pallet guns. Pallet guns, yes. She, the, you know, they, they use these pallet guns uh, and they aim at the face with the intention of blinding you, right? Because that's something also that causes a lot of fear. Right. So she was one of the protesters. And when they used the pallet guns to aim at her mom, she basically went and she used herself as a shield to protect her mom. Was it? Her? I think it was her mom. Was it her dad or her mom? But it was her mom. And she just lost an eye. And she came out so I don't I don't know if you have her messages after she got uh, she was blinded because even after losing an eye, she came out so defiant. And she said that this regime thinks that they could intimidate us by blinding me. <laughs> like, look at the there was another. Of there was another fourteen-year-old boy because she only got yeah. one eye taken out. There was a fourteen-year-old boy who's been blinded yeah. in both eyes by pellet guns. Yes, and I saw this that. girl. If you give me a few minutes, I can continue to find her name. But she gave this story where she she was recounting what happened, and she talked about how she was getting in the way to try to defend her mother. And um, basically, she she talks about how the last thing that her right eye ever saw was the smile of the man that pointed the pellet gun point blank at her face and fired upon her. Yes. Yes. There's so many things I can't show you because the video would get flagged if I did. But what is shocking in the brutality of the things that I can show you here is how eager and how are the regime forces when it comes to hitting people or shooting at them and they they seem they seem to take so much joy in doing so like they come across as absolutely sadistic like i've shown some videos to susanna that i can't show here and it's just unbelievable it just seems like it it, it just seems like it's not they're not just following command it just seems like these are people who are that are desperate to show this level of violence upon people, which is, I, I don't know. Um, her name is Gazal. I can never pronounce it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Gazal Run Josh. Um, and there's like videos of her online where basically she's like, her eye is just decimated. She has a cover on it and she's just covered in blood, but she's still like, you know, laying on the ground, putting up like the peace or victory sign. Like you're not going to deter us. Which is actually an interesting part of the CNN story because I was talking to Babak and he gives me, yeah, there we go, um, a very interesting perspective. And Armin, he said that in Iran there was actually a very negative reaction to this CNN investigative report because from their perspective, they basically believed that this was some sort of regime psyop to discourage them from protesting right yes they want like the regime itself wants this and for this to get out uh so people are scared of coming out um because again there seem to be afraid people seem to be afraid of this kind of treatment more than death um i don't i don't know i don't know if i agree with that anger as because i think th that type of anger encourages more people to come out than stay home. I don't know what the fake this will have. But I mean, it's a crime. You can't hide it. You cannot not expose a crime to as a way to encourage more people coming out. Like crimes like this have to be exposed. I don't understand. I don't understand that criticism. Do you agree with that criticism? No, I mean, I don't. I, I can see their perspective because they're like, we don't, and actually in the report, the people who leaked the information about Armita's brutal treatment, 
the medical staff said specifically, they're quoted as saying, we're not saying this because we want to discourage everyone, but this is so horrific that people need to know what happened. Like, and I think it's important because I've heard the stories of what happened to Armita on social media for a few weeks now, but the details of what they did to her are so barbaric that it's almost unbelievable. They're so gruesome that it's almost yes. unbelievable. That's why it was so, exactly you're right. This is why it's right. so important for CNN to go in and confirm and corroborate all these details, because then yes. you can take that to a Western audience or an outside audience and say, this is the true level of what's going on inside. Like this isn't exaggeration. We've confirmed it. And this is really important because like, I, I can understand how you could feel that way when you're on the inside. But this is this information getting outside and corroborated is absolutely critical in garnering international support. So if this was intended for an Iranian audience, I could see how people could perceive it that way. But it's not intended for an Iranian audience. This is intended for an international or more specifically American audience to basically give them verification of yes. these gruesome details we've been seeing it's and that's so that, i like i cannot stress how important that is it's so easy evil that many people would doubt that it's true like it's just so evil that it just seems like somebody people who just hate the islamic republic would just make that up that's why it was and even though and that's why it wasn't being picked up right like we have saw stories of nika being picked up and shared stories of masa amini stories of kian so many stories of other protesters but this story was so unbelievably evil that it wasn't being shared because people were like uh, i don't know really that evil i don't think that happened so that's why it, now it's getting a lot more attention because it's now been verified i just want to show you the numbers also about the this is the numbers that we have up until november 18th and we this have number more updated just recently, numbers now actually yeah do you do do you have updated numbers because mm -hmm. it just jumped it just jumped recently um just like it, it, yesterday the numbers jumped re by a huge margin because of what happened in uh zahedan <clears throat> but up until november 18th the reg regime had killed 402 protesters and uh 58 of them children 58 of them children so that's so insane right as of four days ago iran human rights who is one of the most trustworthy trustworthy sources said that it's at least 416. And what is so shocking is that, and that's an absolute minimum, I want to remind people. In the last week alone, more than 72 people were killed. In the last week alone. Mm. And 56 of those were killed in Kurdish areas because the crackdown in the Kurdish areas has been so freaking severe, including the releasing of this green gas, which really freaked out a lot of allowed a lot of people talk about intergenerational trauma when Kurdish areas are being gassed with this weird substance that people don't really know what it is and it gives people skin reactions and breathing problems. There, um, I can't remember the name of what it's called, but it has this really freaky green appearance that terrified people. Um, and obviously brought back memories of Saddam. Um, oh, there was something else I wanted to mention. Oh, okay. So when it comes to the story of Amrita, like what's really important is that now I can feel more confident in bringing more information from people that I talk to like personally. And they talk to me about how when they talk to their families back home, their families are like, Yes, when we talk to people who are being imprisoned right now, when they talk to our lawyers, they beg us to bring them abortion pills. They beg us to bring them birth control pills because of how frequently they're being RAP. Like that's the level of what's going on here. I want people to like really let that sink in. That that's the first thing that they ask for when they can finally get in touch with their families after they've been detained for days, weeks, who God knows how long. The desperation. And the other thing that's really noteworthy is that there has been, it's just like 
the state, the utter state of what's going on in the prisons right now, even outside of the systematic RAPE, is horrific. So there's been two reports that came out recently, kind of more generally about um, the prisons in, in uh, particularly Avin and also Karjak prison. And what's happening is that the prisons are so overpopulated that in the women's quarters, there are now viral bacterial and fungal infections because women just don't have what they need to clean themselves properly. And they are also essentially being systematically starved because they just don't have enough food. They don't give prisoners enough food. And if you want to get more food, you have to buy it from the commissary or the canteen. But then the commissary and canteen runs out of food so quickly because of how overpopulated everything is. People are being forced to stay in solitary con um, confinement, except solitary confinement cells are now holding five to six people. The entire prisons just smell like sewage. People are getting maximum 20 minutes of sunlight a week if they're lucky. And as Armin said earlier, like protesters- No bed. Being, no bed. In many prisons, they just have to have people sleeping in the corridors now. Mm. And um, they will also put, yeah, prisoners with actual violent criminals who will assault them. And women are actually, they're sexually assaulted by female guards as part of their strip search. Yeah. Not like, giving you the, not giving you prep, uh, like soap and a toothbrush and everything um, until you confess is really dangerous for women. Like, I think like a lot of men have to understand that cleansing, uh, keeping yourself clean is a lot more of a issue when it comes to women prisons than men's prison. Like you could really torture somebody mentally, woman mentally, especially if they're under period, if you're not giving them, um, you know, proper cleaning material. Um, it's not even just and, mental, like it's also a legitimate health risk. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. The reason why it's a mental is because you know that you are about to get infected. Risk really sick and it's, it's just spreading. It's really disgusting. And, you know, there are certain people that were living completely normal lives and overnight their life just went from having normal lives to just being caught in the middle of the street just because they were in the middle of a protest. And now they're living in the most horrible, in the most horrible condi conditions that they ever imagined. And they're getting uh, prison sentences uh, five, 10, 15, 20 years j based on the judges, like over just standing in the street and doing nothing, just like being part of the protest or holding a sign. And, and they imagine just like living as like a, a young, maybe 16, 20 year old, 15 year old girl with your family having a normal life. And now you're in a disgusting uh, prison, uh, sleeping in the corridor with no food unless you could pay for it. And it's sometimes hard to get money to prisoners so that they can buy pay. They, can, they don't even give you free blankets anymore, right? That's how things are getting, right? They and don't you're give you sharing... free toothbrushes. They don't give you free sanitary pads. They will basically make you yeah. give a forced confession to be able to give yeah. receive sanitary pads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to you need to do something to be able to get even a blanket. And you're sharing like a you're sharing a toilet with a hundred other people, um, and and you, you're like, oh my, this is hell. And you are told that this is your life for the next 10, 15, or twenty years. Imagine like trying to adjust mentally, trying to overcome the idea that this is my life for the next uh, few decades. It's I don't know. I don't know how to explain the shock that some of these people are facing. But anyways, yeah. Um, um, Oxymoron is saying the state is scared. I do, yes, I do think the state is scared. The state is like, the state is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? The state does it wants to intimidate people, but it cannot also. It's trying to figure out. Because every time they kill somebody, that that person's death becomes a rallying cry. 
and more people show up, right? So they're trying not to, they want to, they don't know how to, they, that's why they're not just like shooting everybody with like real bullets, right? Because they know the moment they do that, that would be the end of the regime. Well, the they are they shooting come, a lot of people with real bullets, particularly over the last in, week. We're seeing that more than we ever have in predominantly Kurdish regions. So yes, like, in Kurdistan and Sistan. Yeah, in Kurdistan and Sistan. This is kind of, this is an, an unfortunate situation, which we have to be real with people, okay? I know this is horrible to hear, but they use real bullets in Sistan, Baluchistan, and in Kurdistan, and they use, um, what is it called, pelicans um, in in central places like uh, Tehran or Shir or Fars or Esfahan, right? Uh because they know if they, they if they use real bullets in Tehran, that would be the end of them. But unfortunately, there's we're, this is something that is being fixed right now in Iran because a lot more Iranians feel united with each other. But there's still that degree of Kurdistani people or Baluchi Kurd, Kurdish people or Baluchi people mattering less than other Iranians. And we hope like. Right now, the revolution is trying to encourage people to be as outraged as Kurdish people are dying or as Baluchi people are dying uh, than if somebody from Tehran would be dying. So, but the regime is like, that's why you see different treatment for different kind of people. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know if, I think Susanna is frozen. But another thing I want to say is that what that's why also they're trying to figure out what kind of intimidation tactics they can use that is not death uh, but it will uh, that will keep people off the streets um the regime is trying so many different tactics and it's it's not working so we'll see well but they are they're trying they're brainstorming they're yeah you know yeah i think okay so we have um Armin, in the show oh. notes there was um some okay. stuff i wanted you to bring up um the second one is about Tumaj, if you could bring that up and then so the we have one one. more bad news and then we can go to good news okay this one yes so many people probably remember that we have talked about the case of Tumaj salehi um many times before so Tumaj salehi is a very prominent iranian rapper who is famous for his regime and his songs being very, very critical of the regime and his activism against the regime. He's been arrested and detained before by the authorities. And for the past 40 days, no one has heard about his very little about his whereabouts ever since he was arrested for taking part in the protests. And his family reported at some point that um, they believe that he, the regime, the authorities broke one of his ankles while in detention as part of torture. And yesterday it was officially announced by his family that he has been charged with the crimes, quote unquote, of spreading corruption in the land and waging war against God. And these are both two vague Islamic charges that both carry the death sentence as punishment. And he was denied access to a lawyer of his choice. This quote, quote unquote trial happened behind closed doors. And yeah, I don't know. Too much really has been one of the most bravest people I've ever seen. Like he, he completely was aware. Like this is not something that he didn't know would happen. Like he was expe he expected for him to get arrested and killed. So when he like in his songs and his rap songs against the revolution and stuff and his messages for people, he prepared people for the day when he's not there anymore. Like this was he went in Iran against the regime, standing against them in the most aggressive way possible, uh, knowing that this is his de this is his destiny, this is the outcome. And so he walked into the lion's den, you know, um, directly knowing that, you know, the level of bravery is, 
unbelievable. Like I can't even imagine how that's possible. He was on a different yeah. level. I mean, he would, yeah. you know, always wear a bullet around his neck in his songs, like openly rap about regime officials and insiders having to find rat holes because he's coming after them, you know, to hide in and, um, yeah, no, the, yeah, his his famous song is "Buy a Rat Hole," um, which is telling the regime for the regime officials and everybody supporting them that they all need to go find their own spe their own private rat holes to hide in because the regime is about to fall and they're gonna come for each every one of them. So this is how the level of aggression and you know that he was speaking while living in Iran, while living under the regime. These are the songs that this man made. And he's not like he wasn't just somebody who makes rap songs against the regime. He was also constantly participating in the protests, you know, recording himself, telling people that I'm here. Come join me. Um, you know, we need you here. We need your support. Like so he had like documented himself all the time with his face, telling, showing that he was participating in the protest, knowing that any day they will come for him and they came for him. And they, there was a forced confession video uh, of somebody that looked like him, but is but we said that it's not like him, um, which makes a, the, his family told them that this is not him. Like some, they blindfolded somebody that looks like him, and he said like I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have done this. Um, and people are like, this is his family are saying that's not him. His tattoo and his neck was different and everything. Um, so the family confirmed that this is not too much. Um, Again, this is just what people are saying. But if if that's not, if that wasn't too much, a lot of people are worried for too much because that means that how much that he resisted torture. Like if they had to find somebody else that looks like him to make it look like he was giving you a forced confession, that means that he himself has gone under. People are saying that that means that he himself has gone, has resisted any forced confession even under torture. So they're wondering how much torture he's been under. Uh, I do want to mention... He also explicitly told people that, like, when they come for me, I don't want people... Like, he said, He said, I'm not worried for myself. I'm worried about the day that they come for me and that that day will discourage other people from rising up. That was his worry. That if I'm yeah. gone people will be scared and they won't continue. So I'm telling you now you have to continue. Yes. Yes. I saw so many followers of too much that when he got arrested, instead of coming out and crying um, and say like, we have to remember what too much said, we don't have time to cry for too much. Uh, this is not a time for crying. Um, too much was just like one person and we just have to pick up where he left off. Like we could cry later. That's what they're saying. They're like, stop, stop worrying about too much. Too much is good. They were saying to, these are fans of too much. Based on too much words, they're like, forget too much. Too much is gone. What are you doing now? These people are soldiers. I'm telling you, these people are unbelievable. These are <laughs> the bravery on these people. Um, so, so we have, we actually have two good news. The okay. I do want to highlight something after. Yeah, the you... good news is the first thing that I put in the show notes. Okay, okay. This one? Yes. So the good news is that the absolutely legendary freedom of expression activist and uh, writer, human rights activist, Hussein Ranagi, has been released from prison after 62 days of hunger strike. Hussein was essentially kidnapped by authorities as he was on his way to go present himself to prosecuting authorities anyways. The videos of his kidnapping are crazy. And since then they broke like both of his legs. He already had um, a failed kidney from the last time he was in prison and did a hunger strike. And then since then, he, yeah, was being denied medical care for the entirety of his detention. Um, vomiting blood, just, yeah, his kidneys were failing again. They were extremely concerned that he was basically dying, like, every single day. And, um, I, Armin, could you read the actual caption? 
Can you translate it for us, please? Yes. Uh, guys, don't don't ban anybody unless they're spamming. Uh, let me read the caption. It says, خانواده حسین رونقی با انتشار تصاویری از آزادی این زندانی سیاسی با قرار وسیقه خبر دادن. So it's like, like the family of uh, حسین رونقی, uh, they released this picture announcing that they are, the uh, حسین رونقی has been freed with uh, وسیقه. I think, what is it, what do you call the money that you put in when you free somebody? When you're allowed to go on bail and you've been bonded bail. out. Bail. Bail, yes, yes, yes. Ronaghi pass as Azadi Mustaghiman Bari Dharma Baby Marsam Muntagal Shula Bari Station. So right after he was freed, he was, uh, they took him to the hospital for, to heal him. For um, This guy, right away, is one of the bravest guys I've ever met. I, I'm not going to go over the things that he has done. Um he, you know, he basically dared the regime to come at him and kill him. Like he, he was fully expecting everything he did was with the full expectation of all of this happening to him. Um, his story is so long and so, I, I, I don't know if I could like go saying like, that he's a legend is like yes. a disservice to yes. his legacy. Yeah, because it's insane. <laughs> Right. Um, but it just made me really happy to finally see him sitting next to his parents in these photos because his parents have been sitting outside of Avene prison every single day since his arrest for the past two months, demanding yeah. to hear information about their son to the point that his father. Oh, Susanna was cut again. Let me also, while Susanna comes back, let me also remind you guys, um, I know like you guys already know all of this. But just to remind all of us uh, one more time that these people, like Jose Ronagui, did nothing other than uh, speaking. You know what I mean? Like these people, these treatment, these uh, harsh prison sentences are for crimes such as recording yourself and talking about your opposition to the regime. Just talking about your views, just words. That's how, that's why these people are being treated like this. Uh, but you, you got your back, Susanna. You want, I, I got cut out for a second. I was just going to say that his father even had a heart attack in this process yes. of waiting for his son every single day. And then he still went back at it, like sitting yes. next to his son, like right here in this photo. Like, yes, it's absolutely crazy. The support for Hus Hussein is like of epic proportions. There was a, f a few weeks ago a moment where people thought his life was in imminent danger and yeah. that authorities were taken in to the hospital to basically initiate his death and people went to the hospital in tehran in droves like the call went out and people across the city hundreds of people hundreds of cars immediately drove to the hospital including extremely famous football players like ali dai were pictured driving there showing up in person to, to call on the authorities. Like, we're watching what you do to Hussein. Like, you hurt a hair on his head. We're coming for you. Um, the other very good news is that on November 24th, the United Nations Human Rights Council finally voted for a, the first time for a fact-finding and investigative mission into... Wait, 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 wait. That's what I wanted to say. This actually, so this is what you want to say as well. Let me highlight this, right? Soha, so Soha is saying, and the effing United United Nations is silent. F you United Nations, UN is effing useless. That's actually not true. The United Nations has done um something unique and very, very aggressive. They have United Nations has so, uh, done something that we didn't even imagine that United Nations would take such an aggressive stance against Iran right now. Um, this is the first time that uh, Iran has been taken to uh, to the uh, Human Rights Council for such a... Let me actually bring you up the news. You, you go ahead. I'll just put up the news on the screen while you talk about it. Go on. Well, yeah, like I was saying, it's, it's in the first time they've been brought forward or initiating a fact-finding investigative mission against yeah. the human rights abuses in Iran. Um, but Armin, like people are very conflicted about this. Like, what do you think? A lot of people are like, okay, 
fine, this is good in some ways to see some kind of action, but like, how much is this really going to do? Like, they can't go inside Iran. Iranian authorities are not going to let UN officials in because they already don't. Like, what this good is, is this? What? How would you respond to that? Well, okay, first of all, um, United Nations doesn't have an army, right? So you can't ask United Nations to do some things like, you're like, oh, why Why the United Nations is not doing more? This is based on, if you understand how United Nations is structured, this is one of the most extreme things they could do, right? So the United Nations is limited by the things that they could do. But as far as the things that they could do, they did them, this is close to the max. So given how conservative United Nations is usually about taking actions like this, this is based on UN standards, this is an extreme measure, right? And the significance of this is not that the United Nations itself is going to be able to do something, but this will be used as a reference, as the validity of, for the validity of the claims. And it sets new standards and new um, narratives around what's going on, right? And the investigation, when the United, because Iran is also a signatory to the whole uh, human rights um, agreements that the United Nations has, it is, if this, given that this investigation has now been approved by United Nations Council, that it has to be taken place, the Iranian regime is by agreement um, bound to allow the investigations to happen inside Iran. And they're not going to, okay, so Susanna, wait a second. Like, you don't even know what I'm about to say. I'm not saying that they're going to cooperate. Okay. I know. It's just, it's just the, the, the thought yeah. of it alone, the mere suggestion had me like, oh, come on. <laughs> Sorry. No, but the, be, just be patient. The fact that they're bound to uh, cooperate and not cooperating with that is already a red, another red line and another um, narrative that we're going to have uh, when it comes to building up our arsenal, when it comes to international propaganda that we want to um, fight against that uh, that Iran, because Iran really, really cares about its soft power and its international reputation, right? So Iran being, having on record that Iran is not uh, cooperating with an investigation that is supposed to be investigating puts them out of the fold of countries that are in line with what the you know, what, what is acceptable standards in, in the world, right? And you guys might think this is just a whole bunch of political jargon uh, and it's not actually going to have any influence on Iran, but that's not the case. Every time you see new new narratives being built on an international level based on, or based on institutions and organizations that are supposed to have validity and authority and some credibility, they're always used as a baseline of, at, you know, attack when it comes to soft power on the country. So this is going to have, the reason why a lot of people are disappointed is because they expect like, oh, United Nations, what do you want them to just come in and just stop everything? Which is like, that's how anything works. These things, uh, when you want to build your soft power arsenal against another country's propaganda, you start building the base, you start um, creating credible reports from credible institutions that have international credibility and you build these things piece by piece and eventually if you see the effects it, it's hurt it hurts it does hurt the country it does hurt the regime um so don't dismiss this as important this this has teeth this is not just an announcement that oh we're um this is like even by un standards this is high because this is not like oh we're just concerned uh, we are making recommend recommendations to the Iranian regime. This is actually putting up an investigative uh, body that is supposed to go and unearth uh, what's happening. This is, but th this is the most teeth you could get out of the UN, right? So, well, and a lot uh, of people the, are it's, like it's, hoping that this will serve to help bolster the historical record, so that when the regime falls we have a baseline of evidence that can be used to prosecute people and bring some justice about in an international criminal court. So there's that aspect of it as well. Um, 
Is there any other news from Iran that you wanted to cover this week? I mean, I have a lot, but we we spoke for one hour. Oh, can I just share? Uh, wait, hold on. Let me see. I want to share something. I just this is not the news, but I these there's a lot of songs coming out of Iran. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to share share this one. Uh, this lady, hold on. Let me see. So she's saying, I hate your religion. Curse be upon your customs. <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know this first part what this means, but like she's talking about your hearts made out of stone. And just she repeats that. But like I just wanted to show you, like, this is like, I hate your religion. I am. I, I curse upon your customs. So this is like a lot of people associate the brutality of the regime with the brutality of Islam and the and the religion that is associated with the Islamic Republic. I saw uh, footage I of I saw footage of Keon's funeral being played, and then they put this song like over that footage. Yes, because Keon, who was uh, who was a child who was re- uh, killed by the regime, um, he. He hated the Quran, and when we're going to talk about that later. Actually, <laughs> okay, 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 okay. But let me let me just play this whole because it was it was pretty. Anyways, I just like this song. I just had to share it with you guys. Sorry. Uh, I don't know, it was just it's so aggressive singer. and so passionate. I just like the way she, she was expressing herself. Um, yeah. Let me close this. All right. We can clap for the next news because it's Yay. Quite silly and okay like low stakes in comparison to what we just talked about get my best-selling book why there is no god for free click on the link for it in the description